I'm Caroline Krause, the local outreach minister here at Northside. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're excited to have you here with us. If this is your first time visiting, we would love to meet you. Out in the lobby is a place that we call the living room. Stop by after service and say hi to us. We're happy to answer any questions that you might have or to help you get connected. Every couple needs a night out to laugh, have fun, and invest in their marriage. Sometimes this is easier said than done. So we decided to make it easy and we planned a date night just for you. We call it Better Together. And it even falls right around Valentine's Day. Hint, hint, guys. Better Together is a two hour live event for married, engaged, and dating couples. We're gonna start off with a few laughs from comedian Marty Simpson. And then next, you'll get to hear from pastor and author Gary Thomas, who will help equip your marriage through practical steps. Visit MyNorthside.com and click on the digital bulletin to register, and we'll see you here on February 16th. As always, thank you for putting Jesus at the center of your generosity. From events like Better Together to our local and global outreach efforts, and even this very service, your giving is advancing God's work, and we appreciate you making ministry possible. If you'd like to give today, you can do so by dropping your offering in the giving boxes on your way out of the auditorium. You can give online at mynorthside.com slash give, or you can text the word give to 81212. You picked a great day to join us because we are beginning a brand new all church study on the book of Galatians. It's not too late to join a group for this study. To sign up for a group, visit mynorthside.com and click on the digital bulletin. We can't wait to begin unpacking this book of the Bible with you. Whether you're online or in person, please join us for worship as our service begins. And thanks for being here with us today. Welcome to Northside.
took on flesh to save the lost grace and mercy displayed upon the cross our redemption he's the hope for all mankind one name over everything one name over everything Colossians, referring to 
Jesus, who is over all things, says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. That is our savior, that is Jesus. He has always been, always will be. And that same almighty God became our sacrifice and our death once and for all. So my question is, what are we putting our hope in? What are we saying, yes, Jesus, but also this. Maybe this will carry me through. Maybe this is the hope I can cling to just in this season. So as we sing this next song about the eternal living hope, I encourage you to lay down those things to the side and put Jesus where he belongs, at the center and the head of everything. Gosh, we praise you. our trust in you, the only true living and eternal hope. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
present, for being here, for guiding and leading and directing. Lord, as we begin this, this church study together, I pray that your spirit would lead, your spirit would go before, your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts, allow us to be awakened once again, maybe for the first time or for the second, fifth, hundredth time, Lord, maybe we awaken to the good news of your gospel and the truth of who you are, Jesus. We thank you so much for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all go ahead and have a seat. When I was maybe 14 years old, I swore off vocational ministry. I'd grown up in the church and I'd been around ministry for a long time because of my family. That meant that I had seen the beauty of that world, but I saw the not so great side as well. So even when I began to identify my own strengths and the ways that God might have wired me for that very path, I drew a line in the sand and decided that it wasn't for me. I was okay living a life for Jesus if that meant giving him 90%, but I truly believe that I was entitled to that last 10%, that I'd earned that much and I could do more with it than what God could. I told him I would decide the trajectory for my own life and then maybe later, once I've got that last 10% in order, I'd be open to what he might want to do with it. I bought into a false gospel. It took the entirety of my teenage years, stubborn and hot-headed as I was, fighting a call that I knew God had put on my life before I was willing to align with the true gospel of giving Jesus 100% of my life. The truth of the gospel is simple. Following Jesus requires my full obedience. Don't get me wrong, simple and easy are two different things, but just as Paul teaches in Galatians, Jesus is simple. And there's nothing that we could plan for our lives that is bigger, bolder, and better than a life spent living in 100% alignment with Jesus. Amen. Well, hey, Northside family, it's good to be with you all today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share God's word with you. I consider that a privilege. And if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Aaron. I'm a part of our teaching team here. And you picked a great weekend to be here with us. We're kicking off a brand new series, as Caroline said in her host segment. And I'm very excited to be a part of that with you. Um, this isn't the first time this week that I've had the opportunity to preach the gospel, to share the good news of God's word. In fact, a few days ago, I was invited to speak at a few of my kids' chapel services at their school. And in one a particular service, before I got on stage to share the message, the kids had put together a skit. And in that skit, Jesus was played by a hand puppet of Kermit the Frog. And uh, I can assure you that was a new experience for me to follow that act. But it also gave me some encouragement. You know, if God can use a Kermit puppet to preach the gospel, maybe he can use me too. So he sets the bar pretty low in who he can use, and I'm grateful for that. I'm also feeling pretty good this weekend. I'm looking forward to some things. On Monday, it's my birthday, and so I consider this an early birthday gift to be able to share God's word with you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, another member of our teaching team, Jacob Bales, was uh, anticipating his 30th birthday. He was in mourning, not in celebration. He wasn't looking forward to that. I turned 40 last year. On Monday, I'll be 41. So I'm moving from just being 40 to being in my 40s. And I got to tell you, I'm just embracing it. Okay, God's good. It is what it is. Uh, I'm feeling good today. You know, some people talk about having a good hair day or a good makeup day or a good outfit day. Uh, today, I am having a good feet day. Day. All right, now don't look at my shoes. It's not about those. Cameramen, keep it above the waist, all right? Here's, here's why I'm having a good feet day. It comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who who bring good news. Friends, I'm having a good feet day today because I have the privilege of sharing the good news with you, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm so grateful to be able to do that. And I pray as he reveals himself to you today through his word and through our time together that, that you'll come face to face with the truth of who he is and what he has for you. I just think we started off 2024 in an amazing way here at Northside. We spent the last three weeks in this prayer series talking about how we want to be a when we pray church, not an if we pray church. And so we're moving right from that into this 
all church six week uh, study on the book of Galatians. And so I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles, to go ahead and open those up. If you have print form, you need to flip a few pages. Or if you've got an app on your phone, that's great. We're going to be in Galatians chapter one today. And if you haven't already, I'll plug again. Make sure you grab one of these study guides. You can get it out at the Resource Center after service today. Great resource as we navigate through the text of Galatians over the next few weeks. Uh, But the Bible is a beautiful thing. Uh, It teaches us. It shapes our thinking. It draws us closer to the Father. And so I'm grateful to have the opportunity to jump into it today. You know, this month I'm not just celebrating a birthday, but I'm also celebrating the anniversary of me stepping into full-time ministry. This month it's 18 years that I've had the privilege of serving in the church. And yeah, I wasn't looking for applause, but thank you. God's been faithful. But in, in nearly two decades of ministry, as have, I've had the opportunity to meet with and minister to and counsel with folks. And to talk about this concept of how we grow in our faith probably the number one piece of of encouragement, wisdom, advice that I've given is that growing in our faith is not an overly um, difficult thing to understand. Certainly there's some challenge in practice, but it's really quite simple. If you want to grow in your faith, then you spend time with God, with God's word, and with God's people. And the beautiful thing is that we get to do all three together today as we are together submitting ourselves to the authority of his word and learning what he wants to say to us through it. And so before we get any further into the text, I want to take just a moment to pray and ask God to have his way in our time together. So if you would join me in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the gift of your word, the Bible. And Father, I pray that as we today and in the weeks to come focus specifically on the book of Galatians, that you would reveal yourself in whatever way you want to in our lives independently as well as in our church collectively. Father, for those who perhaps are new to the faith and haven't spent a lot of time reading the Bible, I pray that this would be a, a, a wondrous time where they maybe for the first time think seriously and open their hearts to what you might have to say to them through it. For those who have been following you for years, maybe even decades, and have read this text more times than they can recount, I pray that they would read it and experience you in a new and fresh way. Wherever any of us might be, God, I know you want to meet us there. And so we invite you to do what you want to do, to do what only you can do. Speak to us, Lord. Use your word to shape us and to draw us closer to you. And I pray all of this in the beautiful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to start with the who and the to of the book of Galatians. Who is this letter to and who is writing it? And we'll start with the to. This letter is to the Galatians. So who are they? Well, they are Jesus followers who are under uh, Roman rule in the province of Galatia. And uh, this is in Asia Minor in what is now modern-day Turkey. These are primarily Gentile believers, and what that means is they are not Jewish, but they have come to put their faith and trust in the Messiah, Jesus. And yet at the same time, they are under heavy influence from Jewish Christians or from Jews who claim to be following Jesus. And we'll talk more about that in a few moments. The Galatians are receiving this letter around 48 AD, and so it is one of the earliest letters that we find in our New Testament portion of the Bible. And so that, that's who this letter is to. The who, uh, as it refers to the author, is Paul, the Apostle Paul. And not only is he the author of this letter, but he also was an active participant in planting the churches that are receiving this letter. And so this is very near and dear to his heart, this communication and this people that he's communicating to. And if we want to learn about Paul, I would be inclined to let us learn from his own words and to let scripture speak for itself. And so if we skip down a few verses and we start in verse 11, here's what we read about Paul. He says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. And so who is Paul? Well, he is enemy turned apostle. He is persecutor turned preacher. He is one who was full of zeal for the religious traditions handed down to him, but one who had completely missed the heart of the father until he came face to face with the son. In other words, he's someone who has a sketchy past. He's someone who has some baggage. I wonder if anyone here can relate to that. I know I can, and it's a good opportunity for me to pause before we go any further to say, if you're here today or you're joining us online and there's any part of you who feels like your past disqualifies you from full participation in the church, if you even have an inkling that if someone around you knew what you had done or maybe even what you're still struggling with, that you wouldn't be welcome here, you've got to know that you are welcome and that this is a place for you, that the heart of God is for those who are far from him. And his desire is to show up not when we've got ourselves cleaned up, but when we recognize that we can't do it on our own. And God is willing to meet us wherever we are. And so wherever you are today, good, bad, or ugly, you need to know that he loves you and he invites you to know him more. That's Paul's story. He's, he's got a past and it's significant and it's not all great. And yet, Paul went from others praying for protection from him to praising God for him. Incredible change in his life that these people who were once afraid of him are now proud of him. And personally, I can't think of any better thing that could be said about my life than others praised God because of me. And by God's grace, he was able to do that for Paul. And by God's grace, he's able to do that for you and I. But what does that What changes a murderer to a worshiper? Well, in a word, it is the gospel. It is the good news about Jesus. And so we've talked about the who and the two. Now let's get down to the what. And we skipped down to verse 11, and I want to move back to verse 3 as you're following along. And here's what Paul writes in verse 3 of Galatians 1. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pause for just a moment. This is a familiar greeting of Paul's grace and peace. And these two themes, these two concepts are significant in Scripture. Grace being unmerited favor. That is receiving from God good things that we don't deserve. 
And if grace is unmerited favor, then peace is unmitigated wholeness. In other words, we can experience complete satisfaction in him, that by the grace of God, we can have peace through Jesus. And I'd like just to offer as we're in this series, perhaps the unofficial greeting of Northside over the next six weeks as we see one another and pass one another in the halls, if we could just say grace and peace to one another. And initially my notes said, this is a point where I'd pull that preacher move where I would say, turn to your neighbor and say grace and peace to one another. And then I remembered not everyone is a golden retriever like me. In fact, some of you would rather die than talk to the person next to you that you don't know. And so I'm going I'm to let you off the hook here today. And let's just greet one another in practice. And then I'd invite you to do that as we move forward. So grace and peace. Grace and peace. Thank you. When we say grace and peace to one another, what we're saying is, I hope you experience God's favor given freely through Jesus and the complete satisfaction that comes as a result. Grace and peace. Verse three into verse four. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. And what we have here from Paul, just in this one verse, in verse four, is a pretty good outlining of the gospel. And when we talk about gospel, that word gets thrown around a lot. It comes from the Greek word euangelion, which is Greek for good news or glad tidings. And specifically, when we see it in the New Testament scripture of the Bible, it means the good news about Jesus and what he's done for us. And so I want to rest here. I want to pause here for just a moment in verse 4 and take a look at this because it really gives us a good picture of what the gospel is. And that's critically important because that allows us to determine what the gospel isn't, which is equally uh, meaningful. And so as we see the gospel in verse 4, we see four elements of the gospel. The first is this, that Jesus gave himself, who gave himself. This is critically important because part of the good news of the gospel is that nobody forced Jesus' hand. No one took Jesus' life. He gave it. He laid it down willingly. We didn't have to twist his arm. We didn't have to beg and plead because we knew we couldn't do it on our own. He chose to give himself for us. That's a big deal. And that's the second item or element of the gospel. He gave himself for what? For our sins. Friends, we've got a sin problem. We don't have to look very far at all to see that things aren't the way they should be. In fact, we don't even need to look beyond our own hearts to see where we have missed the mark. God in his perfection created and gave us life. We very quickly took things into our own hands and made our own choices. And that brokenness in us that the Bible calls sin or missing the mark is what has separated us from a perfect God. And it's not a dilemma that we could scratch and claw our own way out of. God made a way through Jesus that he would give himself, not for what he had done, but for what we had done for our sins. The third element, to rescue us. Specifically, to rescue us from the present evil age. And it's interesting that as Paul's writing this, they were experiencing a present evil age, and it sure doesn't seem like things have gotten a whole lot better, does it? I mean, look around us, and we can see that we're living in an age that's full of chaos and confusion and heartbreak and misery, Difficult circumstances abound. Collectively, we are a train wreck in a dumpster fire. Things are not good. And yet we don't have to be overwhelmed by what's happening around us or what's happening in us. 
that God in his grace has made a way that Jesus gave himself for us to rescue us. And the fourth element, because it was God's desire and plan. It was according to the will of our God and Father. He, he wanted to do this. It was his plan to make a way for us to be redeemed and restored to a right relationship with him. Now, I want you to notice that in these four elements of the gospel, there is no element that is dependent on us. In other words, that we have a choice to make in how we respond to the good news, but not what we respond to. In other words, this is good news whether or not we receive it and allow it to shape our lives. The gospel is the good news about God's victory over sin and death through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then Paul makes a shift here, beginning in verse 6. He writes, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. It reminds me a little bit of an experience I had not too long ago in my son Judah's bedroom. Uh, we got through Christmas, and uh, please don't uh, judge me or shame me in this, but from Christmas until just about a week and a half ago, uh, things got a little crazy in Judah's room, and he got a few toys at Christmas, and those toys ended up on the floor in his room, and we really hadn't done a whole lot of good cleaning in his bedroom since Christmas, and it had gotten bad. You know what I'm talking about? Like it's a landmine, you're tiptoeing through to say goodnight, and you're muttering under your breath when you step on a you know, Ninja Turtle action figure or whatever. And so finally it got to the point where it's, I got to do something about this. And so on, on my day off, while the kids were at school, I got in there, um, again, Sad to say, it took me a couple of hours to get this room back into shape. It was, it was pretty bad and felt good after it was done. Like, finally, I can, I can dodge those Ninja Turtles and I'm putting them in bed. And, and I promise you, it wasn't a day later that what happened? Yeah, a, a healthy portion of those things that I'd cleaned up are right back where they were on the floor in his room. And I was very calm about it. And I just picked him. No, I wasn't. I lost my mind. I said, Judah, get in here. Get in your bedroom. What is this? And then I'm kind of losing my mind. He's just sort of staring at me with those doe eyes. And I'm, I'm like, dude, why would you want to live this way? And he just blankly stares at me. He didn't have to say anything. It was like, Dad, I'm five. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and I was astonished that things had gone so bad so quickly. And that's not a, that's not a perfect illustration by any means. But Paul says, I am astonished that in this short period of time, you have already left behind the good news of the grace of God and you're exchanging it for a lie. You're right back in the mess that you were before you met Jesus. You see, Paul planted these churches in Galatia probably around 47 AD, and he wrote this letter to them in 48 AD. A.D. approximately, and that's pretty quick. A group of Jewish Christians referred to in Scripture as Judaizers, they've, they've come after Paul has planted these churches and moved on, and they've taught these new converts to Christianity that they need to follow the Jewish law in addition to having faith in Jesus. And this is a perversion of the gospel that makes it no good news at all. And, you know, I think that what I find myself often doing is reading scripture and having, you know, hindsight being 2020, reading and thinking, how, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever think that? Why would you ever, you know, believe that? And it's easy to see in retrospect, but what's true is even today, many of us struggle with a similar false gospel. 
And in my nearly two decades of ministry of experience, I, I've, I've seen this time and time again, that some people have a picture of the gospel as a relay race. And more specifically, um, they believe that Jesus gets you to a certain point and then when you have faith and believe in him, he passes the baton off to you and says, all right, good luck. I've done the hard work. Now it's up to you. I forgave all your sins. And so now stay on the straight and narrow. It's your turn now. And there is a false belief that still persists today that we have some role to play in our salvation. And a more accurate picture of the gospel is that Jesus finished his race. He crossed the finish line and then he put that gold medal on your neck. And you didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. And yet he gives it freely. And for many of us, that's, that's a tough pill to swallow. We're not big fans of charity. We kind of feel like we have to have some type of role in the outcome here. There's certainly, there's something I have to do to, to make sure that I, I have the hope of eternity. And what's true is that we've got a race to run, but it's not a race to earn salvation. It is a race in which we get to live out the joy of our salvation. And our only role in the gospel is a response to what has already been done for us. In verse 8, Paul goes on to write, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. The language Paul uses here is extreme and he doubles down on it because it's a big deal. Cursed be anyone who preaches a message different than what you first accepted. Cursed be anyone who twists the truth of what Jesus has already done to lead you to believe that your salvation also depends on what you do. And this new gospel is really no gospel at all because it's not good news if it's up to me or it's up to you. Verse 10, Paul writes, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Maybe you've heard this uh, statement before. In marriage, you can either be happy or right, but you can't be both. <laughs> Some things just can't coexist. You can please people or you can serve Jesus, but you can't do both. And I have to acknowledge that I am a recovering people pleaser. And I often find it hard to choose between what God is calling me to and what I feel like the people around me want me to do. Maybe you can relate, some of you. And that might not be your particular dilemma, but for many, we, we struggle and, and find ourselves thinking that maybe something else is, is better or more important than what God has for me. And maybe we wouldn't even ever say that, but our lives prove it to be true. And I would just offer that perhaps your view of the good news isn't good enough if that's the case. Perhaps your view of the beauty of the gospel is lacking 
if you find yourself believing that there's something bigger or bolder or better than it. One of the questions that I often ask my kids before I tuck them into bed at night is, we've been doing this for years, it's just a simple question. It's kind of a call and response. I say to them, hey, how big is God? And their response is big enough. And from a very young age, I wanted them to have just seared into their mind and heart that no matter what they were facing, no matter what was going on, no matter what seemed to be a really big deal, that God would always be bigger, that he'd always be big enough. How big is God in your view? Here's what we believe. The gospel is bigger because nothing can be added to it in order to earn it. We believe the gospel is bolder because it is a message for all people for all time. And we believe that the gospel is better because it transforms our lives and invites us to share it with the world around us. So my question for you is simple. How will you respond to the gospel today? As you come face to face with the good news, the real good news of what Jesus has done for you, giving himself for us to rescue us because that was God the Father's will, how will you respond? Maybe you're here today and you have yet to accept the free gift of salvation that God offers through Jesus. And I just want to put it on your mind and heart. Next weekend is a baptism weekend here at Northside. It's an opportunity to say yes to Jesus and to accept that free gift. If that's something that you're thinking about and the Lord is prompting you with, head out to the living room after service and talk to somebody about that. Go to MyNorthSide.com. You can get more information about Baptism Week and even register to be baptized next weekend if you're ready. Maybe that's not what God is calling you to do in response to the gospel. Maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you're still figuring some things out. In the next few moments, we're going to have an opportunity just to be with the Father in prayer as we take communion together. And I'd like you to go ahead and get your communion out, those emblems you grabbed on your way in. And for a few moments, I just want you to reflect on and remember that when we take communion, it is a declaration of the good news of Jesus. It is a symbol, it is a picture, it is a reminder that he gave himself for us to rescue us because it was God's plan all along. And as you take the bread that represents Jesus' body and the juice that represents his blood, would you pray a simple prayer? God, how would you have me respond to your good news today? Take a moment to be with the Father.
good news in the gospel. If you need prayer, please stay in your seat. We'd love to meet with you, pray with you. Let us walk with the good news this week. God bless you. I'll see you next weekend.